In this video, I will provide an example of survival analysis. Before you proceed here, please make sure that you have watched my other video on the introduction to survival analysis. In this uh, example, we will talk about the survival hazard and cumulative hazard functions. Then we will talk about non-parametric analysis, particularly the Kaplan-Meier survival function and the hazard rates. And then we will estimate parametric models, the exponential Weibull, Gompertz, and log logistic. And finally, we will estimate the semi-parametric models, uh, in particular the Cox proportional hazard model. So we would like to study unemployment duration or the length of time that it takes for someone to find a full-time job. We have data here from the January Current Population Surveys, displaced workers supplements for several years. The dependent variable for us would be duration or the number of periods that someone is being unemployed and the event or the failure would be finding a job. Now notice the irony of that is that the failure event is actually a good thing. That's to find a job. Uh, the independent variables that we will consider are the log of wage, whether or not they have claimed unemployment insurance while they were unemployed, and age. So when we summarize the data, these are the things that we find. First, the subjects are tracked from 1 to 28 periods and they either find a job for which they would be the event or they're still looking. That's a censored observation as we talked before. The number of subjects in the sample is 3,343 and time at risk, which would be summing up the periods over all the subjects, is uh, 20,887. So we have this many number of subjects, 3,000 something, and each of them has from 1 to 28 periods that they're tracked in the sample. So if you sum up the number of periods for each of these subjects, you get that number of 20,000 something. The number of failures is 1,073, or that's 32% of the sample has failed, just dividing this number, the 1,000 something, divided by the 3,000 something. The incidence rate would be 5.13%, which is the number of failures, this number, 1,073, divided by the time at risk, the 20,000 number. So let's look at the survival function table. Here, um, all the observations that we have are um, lined up from the first time period to the last time period, and we have 28 time periods in the sample. We are starting with the full sample of 3,343 observations, and in the first time period, we have uh, 294 of them experienced the failure, failure or the event, which was a good thing in their case, they found a job, and then we have 246 that we lost, we don't know why, they're the censored ones. So, uh, what would be the survival function? Uh, this would be the hazard rate, would be how many have failed, divided by the total number at risk. So, the survival function would be 1 minus these failure rates, divided by the number of subjects, or 0.91. So, after one period, we have 91% surviving, which means they're still unemployed. The second period, we start with 2,803, and this is this number minus those that failed minus the net lost or censored. And same thing, here we have 178 failing. This would mean a hazard rate of 178 divided by this. The survival function would be the hazard rate that I just mentioned, this number divided by this. One minus that times this survival function and that would be 0.85 and so on. So if we go all the way down, we could see that in the last 28th period, we only had um, four subjects, none of them experienced the event, and we all lost them to censoring, and the survival rate is 0.31. So 31% 31 of the sample were still unemployed as of the end of the study, 
uh, and we would see that number show up later in the figures. On the next slide here, I have um, drawn the hazard rate, which shows the probability of having an event or finding a job, which is going down from, see the 4% here to 3%. Notice that that's not zero, that's a 3% to 4% is the scale. And you can see how um, it's not a, a linear function and it's not a monotonic function. But in general, it's going, uh, it has gone down, particularly if, if you've been unemployed for quite a while, then the chance of you exiting or having the event of finding a job goes down over, over time. The Nelson Allen cumulative hazard function cumulates all of these hazard rates, and we can see those are increasing over time uh, and approaching uh, it, and approaching one, which is the maximum possible. So here's the Kaplan Meyer survival estimate, and that one is very good to include in papers. It shows the survival probability. So in the first period, we started with 100%. After one period, we had the 91%. If you remember from the table, we're just drawing these numbers from the table. Then the next one is going down and so on. And after 28 periods, we have uh, this one here, which is a 31% rate survival uh, after, after 10 periods, after 28 periods. So after 10 periods, oh, that's about 60% survival rate, which means they're still unemployed and looking for a job. Now, here's something interesting that you can do. Uh, here's the survival estimates that are plotted for two groups. The first group is those that don't uh, have unemployment insurance, and this is the blue line here, the bottom line, and the ones that have unemployment insurance, they are on the top. And um, this is the survival functions, and the function of, oops, the function of those that have unemployment insurance, notice that it's always higher than the one below. What does that mean? See, for, for say, for period number 10, those that have unemployment insurance are, say, 70% likely to still be surviving and be unemployed, and those that don't have they're only surviving at the rate of 50%. So what does that mean? That means that if someone receives unemployment benefits, they're more likely to still be unemployed. So that's kind of bad, right? You, you get unemployment insurance, and then you're more likely to continue to be in the sample, and you're not finding a job. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that was the non-parametric analysis, and now we're going to talk about the parametric regression model coefficients. And I have estimated here the exponential Weibull, Gompertz, and the Cox proportional hazards model. These are the coefficients, and we have three independent variables, log wage, whether or not they have claimed unemployment insurance, and age. Now, notice that different software would estimate uh, and provide different results. These results that I provided here are coming from the Stata software. SAS would produce op opposite results for this, uh, for the exponential Weibull and Gompertz, and R would produce opposite results for exponential and Weibull. So it means that if you see them in the in the output, they would have minus signs there. Um, and then to complicate things, this Weibull viable regression results, they're just a little bit different coming from the SAS and R software than what I have recorded here from Stata. So I know this is very confusing. One tip that I can give you is whichever software you use, use the Cox proportional hazard model because it gives consistent uh, coefficients across all the software and then these are the correct signs across all the software and then look if those results are opposite, then they shouldn't be. Uh, and you may want to uh, readjust your explanations. 
it's okay to report them as negative in your um, in your papers. However, you need to adjust the interpretation accordingly so you're not interpreting just the opposite of your findings. So how do you interpret these coefficients? You say that individuals that have higher wages here would have lower unemployment duration. So a positive, this is the counterintuitive part. You have higher coefficient but you have lower unemployment duration, which means that they will terminate their unemployment faster. The event will occur sooner for them. An individual who claim unemployment insurance would have higher unemployment duration, which means that they would terminate unemployment slower or they will be hanging around in the unemployment pool of people. And remember that this is, was a very consistent result with the graph of the two groups that I showed you on the previous slide. If they have unemployment insurance, they will, uh, um, they will actually have higher unemployment durations. And that's how you interpret this table. These are the coefficients coming from these models. And one thing that's common is also to interpret the hazard rates. This is the table of the hazard rates, and uh, you can see, you know, they're fairly consistent across models, which means, oh, just pick one and, and do it for your paper, you know, it, um, they all kind of produce the same conclusions. So the way to interpret this, uh, I will go ahead with this coefficient. If you have a unit increase in the log wage, that is associated with 1.6 with 62% increase in the hazard rates. So if you have higher incomes, or if it's a one unit increase in log wage, this means, um, you know, we have percent increase in log wage, that would be associated with 62% increase in hazard rates. And for individuals that claim unemployment insurance, the hazard rates would be 0.34 minus one, that would be 66% lower. So if they claim unemployment insurance, their hazard rates are lower, which means that they're less likely to exit the pool of unemployed. So they're getting the unemployment insurance and continuing to stay unemployed. Uh, this, is, this is what we're saying. And they're less likely to find a job. Okay, so now we have the example and I'm going to go ahead and show you how to estimate these models using different software. So please watch the next videos.